Welcome to Atheist Talk. I'm your host tonight, George Kane. Tonight's episode we're calling Philosophy 101. We're going to have a discussion about some basic concepts in philosophy from the perspective of an atheist. My guest tonight is Jordan Peacock. Uh, Jordan is a software consultant and co-founder of a new startup company named Becoming Machinic. He's completing a master's degree in European graduate school in Switzerland in the study of uh, political theology and the philosophy of technology. Jordan is a speaker with the Minnesota International Center and is giving talks on privacy in the information age to great decisions groups around the Twin Cities. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you. So let's start off by considering what are the implications of when a person reaches the atheist conclusion? Some of the biggest shocks, I think, is when you start realizing that you had a lot of ideas in your worldview <clears throat> that you didn't realize assumed a god. Mm -hmm. But now that you've let go of your belief in God, eventually you start realizing that these other beliefs I have no longer make sense because they, they assumed this belief in a deity, As, especially when you have a, a monotheistic idea like a lot of Christians have or uh, Jews or, or Muslims where you have this God that's all-encompassing and in control of everything and is transcendent and universal and consistent across time and then when you start trying to actually engage with how does society actually work how do people actually work when you start really understanding the implications of things like evolution and that completely transforms the rest of your worldview. And that can often be a delayed effect. You know, in many cases you'll find people who've given up the idea of God, but they'll often still hold on to ideas that implicitly require God, <laughs> but that connection hasn't necessarily been made yet. So that's often a, a slow process after a deconversion experience mm -hmm. as people discover that something else needs to change, something else doesn't quite fit anymore, and I have to reevaluate that. And that's difficult, I find. I, I found personally, and I know a lot of other people have found, where they thought that they dealt with everything, giving up God. Okay. So are you thinking mostly of uh, uh, ethics or epistemology when you're saying that there are gaps in the worldview after, after a change from God belief? I think both are profoundly affected. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, epistemology, for a start. One of the Epistemology, most, just for those in yeah. the audience who might not be familiar with the term, is a theory of knowledge. How do we know things? Yeah, and, and how do you know that you know them? And one of the most freeing things that I found with atheism is that I was no longer obligated to know everything. Mm. <laughs> Under theism, you, you almost feel like, well, if, if I have a relationship with a god that is all-knowing or who is responsible for everything in existence, then this predicates that I need to at least have consilience with my knowledge about everything. It can't con contradict or be too out of whack. And that's a pressure that you see with how a lot of people, even believers, try to engage with evolution is it's evolution within the terms of whatever their understanding of belief is. A God-directed evolution. Yes, case. yes. So they might say, well, God works through evolution and then shove under the carpet how something like 99% of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. I, I think that's mm -hmm. Dawkins so that said that. And how do you square that then with a loving creator? That, that's one of those really hard problems. And, and there are Christians who say, well, we can't, we can't dispute the facts of evolution but we can't quite square it with our theology either, and so there's a, there's a bit of a tension inherent with that. In the most extreme Christians, of course, they do dispute the facts of, of evolution because yes. they, they have their own timeline of uh, with the world beginning uh, 6,000 years ago and uh, uh, dinosaurs existing with Adam and Eve. Yeah, there's a friend of mine recently uh, produced an idea, he called it youngest earth creationism. And it was this idea and the idea is not new, but he just coined the term for it. And it's this idea that God just created the universe just a second ago. God just created the universe. Uh, 
and he created it so that it had this illusion of a history and you have memories of uh, having been in existence for longer than a moment but really everything was just created exactly as as it stands just a moment ago and the benefit of that is it's utterly unfalsifiable (laughs) but then the question becomes well you can you can propose equally ludicrous unfalsifiable uh, versions of the worldview and really what's the action that comes out of that and, and we can't even if that were true I wouldn't be able to behave any differently than I'm currently behaving it doesn't I don't have anything that that any actions that that worldview implies and so you have a very strong problem with that one of my favorite ad hoc uh, uh, explanations from new earth creationists is uh, when you point out that uh, stars are millions of light years away and how is that possible if if they were only created 6,000 years ago? And I've heard the answer, well, light has slowed down a lot. Light is getting tired. And light used to be instantaneous, traveling all all these great distances. Again, unfalsifiable. And you can get some really uh, peculiar beliefs with that as well. But I think one of the things that the that the rationalist community and the atheist community has really stressed is, well, let, let's try to aim for falsifiability wherever mm-hmm. possible. And, and that, you can, that doesn't cover all of our beliefs. There's some beliefs where you can't boil it down to a, a sheer fact where uh, maybe it bottoms out in a belief uh, that's based in values. And so you mentioned right. ethics. Um, and you'll often find people that will at bottom disagree not because there's a dispute on the facts those are the easiest ethical dis- disputes to make if you have someone that you share values with and yet you disagree about you know what moral behavior is often it's simply a matter of coming to terms with what the exact facts of the matter are but when you have someone where you agree on the facts and yet you disagree on what is to be done about those facts, that's a very difficult problem to have. And I had an encounter with that with a friend not too long ago who, it was a discussion about seatbelts. We started arguing about you know, whether or not there should be laws regarding seatbelts and what sorts of laws. And we actually had the time and the inclination to dig into it and really figure out, well, why are we actually disagreeing about this? And what we found ultimately was that we had radically different ideas about what what was incumbent upon us as members of a, of a society. You know, for him, he felt that being part of a society didn't actually um, require anything of him, didn't demand anything of him. Uh, he could be a part of a society, but he was completely untethered to it and independent of it. And I disagreed with it. And recognizing that we have this very profound disagreement changes the terms of the debate. Mm-hmm. And I, I can see how uh, the tools that you work with might differ too. For example, the analytical tools that a consequentialist mm-hmm. uh, might, uh, might use, uh, such as a utilitarian, versus someone who bases his morality on uh, humanist values, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, so to be clear, so consequentialism is where you reason about what is or isn't moral based on the effects of the action, not on the action itself. Um, Utilitarianism is where you're looking for what's going to provide the net benefit or the strongest net benefit. And that might be something where the actual results of that may not be desirable in a small setting. So maybe it's a a problem for me, but the, the broader consequences are beneficial. And so the utilitarian might say that I'll do something that in a small scope seems immoral but it's actually causing a a broader benefit to society and then the last thing is really the eudaimonia the virtue ethics and this idea that you have values that you don't really they kind of bottom out you don't really have a, a justification for them except that these values seem to be correlated with what we understand to be a good life and so we'll hold these values and we'll take actions based on those values and at the, at the limit where that will contradict with those other two systems is where you'll take actions on those values even if the consequences don't seem correct and even if the, uh, the net benefit doesn't seem to be there. Right. In the uh, uh, 
for Christians, it's easy to be a deontologist, that actions are good in themselves because God likes them, God approves of them. And the responsibility on an atheist, if he believes that actions are good in themselves, he has to find a basis for the moral value. But the Christian doesn't get outside of that dilemma either. There's the famous mm -hmm. Euthyphro's dilemma, which is the question, and this was posed not of the Christian gods, but of the Greek gods. It was, are the gods good in and of themselves, and therefore whatever they do is good? Or are they referring to some primordial goodness that they are simply participating in? And that's a huge problem for Christians because you say, well, if God's referring to some external goodness, then that kind of dim diminishes our idea of God. But if, God, if anything God does is necessarily moral, then you really have no way to distinguish between what is and isn't moral on any ongoing basis unless you bring a lot more to the, the equation. And the analogy I've given to some believers that I've talked to is, you know, in, in your own scriptures, you have people like uh, Abraham, who God commands to sacrifice his son. So if you have a member of your congregation who says, I'm going to harm my child because God told me to, well, you have no basis for saying that they're wrong because whatever God says is necessarily moral and you don't have any other measure to compare that against. That's called divine command morality and it's hugely problematic precisely for that reason. You, yeah. you have no grounds to say that's an immoral act at that point. Yeah, and if the only basis for an action uh, being good is that God approves of it, can God change his mind? Yeah. And it seem, if you're, you hold the position that no, God cannot change his mind, then it seems that puts the believer in the position of imposing beliefs upon the God. Yeah. And, and you see some of the similar problems with those who've tried to stake out a kind of a scientific morality because science is a moving target. Mm -hmm. And what we understand to be moral has changed substantially even just in the last century. And things that were scientifically common sense and just obvious, we've since found to be incorrect. So you think of some of the uh, racialist notions that, well, of course, these different groups of people across the world are different. And therefore, there's, there's a, a naturalistic reason for why uh, some behavior is moral for some groups and other behavior is moral for other groups and those might not be the same moralities. And, you know, after the benefit of a century or so, you realize that the foundations, the empirical foundations for most of those ideas were completely fell away. And we've now replaced them with other, other ideas, but the problem is, is we don't know that our ideas today. And a good example of this is um, with with animals. So right now you'll find different people who the sphere of moral concern for animals is still very much um, disputed, I would say. Whereas right now you'd be hard pressed to find someone who will actually be caught saying that, yes, I believe that there's different moralities for different people or that the, human, the worth of a human life for someone of my nationality is intrinsically better than the, the, the worth of a human life for some other nationality. Some people might act as though they believe it, but they'll be hard pressed to say it because we, we, our discourse very much discourages that. We still see that very strongly with animals where some people will extend moral concern to all animals. Uh, some people will extend moral concern to uh, sentient animals or you know, there, there's different gradations. And the way we engage with that is, is really telling um, particularly when you have that, that moment where you'll recognize that there isn't a dilemma and yet your behavior won't change. Uh, a lot of people treat, you know, there's the um, reductio ad Hitlerum concept, the idea that arguments on the internet necessarily reduce to calling each other Nazis. But I mean, one of the facts of the matter is most Nazis didn't consider themselves Nazis in the way that it's used as a pejorative. And to get into the mindset of that, it's useful to think of something like, if you feel discomforted by how meat is created and the treatment of the animals in that process, and yet you still eat meat, there's this very similar kind of disconnect where you say, well, in theory, I disagree with this, and this is morally problematic. But in practice, this doesn't 
uh, you know, giving this up or changing is too much of, a, of an inconvenience and there's too much already in, in favor of this process continuing and so it's easier for me to just simply not make a fight and not change my life. And I think I call it methodological moral anti-realism where you say we're not going to, uh, if you're having a disagreement with someone, it's best to imagine that they're not evil and they're not stupid. Okay, if this person isn't evil and they're, they're not stupid, what do they have to believe is good for, what they're to be, for them to be doing what they're doing? With ethical ideas and concepts changing over time as, as society changes, uh, it poses a real problem too for those with a traditional uh, morality such as based upon a, a scripture. Uh, you were mentioning treatment of animals and Dr. Kim Socha wrote a book on uh, uh, atheism and veganism. Okay. And she spends the early chapters of that book uh, discussing how uh, ideas of animals existing just to be of service to, uh, to man is embedded in the scriptures of, uh, of several, several religions. But it deals with uh, other things we see frequently in culture wars in mm -hmm. the United States, such as same-sex marriage or just dealing with uh, the issue of sexual orientation, that uh, uh, people who base their ethics on the Bible are basing it upon the biases of a er much earlier civilization. Yeah. Well, and I think the impulse behind the discovery of let's find a once for all scientific morality mm -hmm. that we can all uh, get around is really the same idea that is the attraction for a moral ground in theism, you know, something that God delivers. Because it's that same idea of what could be called a transcendent guarantor, you know, something that is that view from nowhere, it's external to any particular circumstance, it's external to our own history, it's external to our, our psychology, it's external to our, our very existence, and you can say that is something that we can rely on. And you see the same kind of impulse in, a, in and you, I would call it a, a, a religious impulse even if there's no theistic content. So you look at some political movements, for instance. Uh, Marxism is a good example of this, where uh, you could call certain kind strains of the ideology of Marxism religious in a structural sense, even if there's no theistic content, because it's serving the same role for the, the people professing it and the people acting on it that religious thinking does. And the hard thing, a few people like Levi Bryant and Pete Rollins have uh, conceptualize this idea of an atheology where it's not just a giving up of God, but it's giving up of this transcendent guarantor, this, this need to have something that's outside of our history. And then to move into our own history and to say, we're going to have to make meaning and we're going to have to make decisions about what is and isn't right based out of our own perspective and history. And we don't have the, the ability to say that um, the future won't condemn us. That's, mm -hmm. that's a hard pill to swallow. Uh, there's a magazine online called Aeon, and they do a lot of articles that are touching on philosophy and, and questions about the world. And someone posted a question on there, which was, what will the future condemn us for? And that is a, a great question, because it's it one is. of those things where what are the common places that, that we hold that really aren't going to survive. You mentioned a couple already that are in that process of, mm -hmm. of falling apart. Yeah, the idea of the transcendent guarantor, I think that uh, people from a variety of, of uh, ethical positions uh, want to uh, hang their hat on some, <coughs> uh, on some objectivity to mm -hmm. ethics. That uh, for a religionist, it's things are uh it falls into it being unchangeable. The things can't change because God is unchanging and eternal. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, an atheist, it could be uh, consequences, as we said, that things do happen in the real world, and we can, we can evaluate that, and so that would be the objectivity. What else do you see? Do you ever see conflicts between atheists on, uh, on how they achieve objectivity? Oh, absolutely. We've even uh, seen it at some of our, our gatherings where uh, 
different people, and they're both good people who are trying to be moral individuals, will come to different conclusions about the same situation and the same facts because they're either approaching it through one of the different frameworks we talked about. So if you have a consequentialist and a utilitarian both arguing about the same issue, they might come away with different uh, programs for what to do next. Um, one, one of the things that has been particularly striking is this idea of, um, you mentioned some of the, the religious background, this idea of um, you know, people who've given up some of these ideas like um, the role of animals and sexuality and things like that, that have been based in an old you know, scriptural text or through tradition and whatnot. A lot of times when I'll talk to those sorts of people, they, they don't even wrap their heads around the idea of a, a morality that is both non-theistic and non-universal. And they'll often throw, throw back things like, well, you can't believe that um, murder is right. And you say, well, okay, murder is one of those things that, it's interesting what we do and don't call murder, first of all. Mm -hmm. Murder tends to only be called murder within our in-group. When, when we're murdering people outside of our in-group, it's usually called war or it's called something different. Um, and, and we don't usually classify those things the same way. So there's, there's something telling there. But then the other thing is you think about it and you say, well, when you really start understanding evolution at the level of species groups, um, at the level of populations, you say, well, what's fit? If everyone's indiscriminately killing each other, how long is that society really going to survive? And, and in nature, you see common patterns that persist, where they persist because that solution works. And I think prohibitions on murder for people in, that you're in relationship with is one of those things where societies that don't have that don't tend to persist. So that's something that's near universal. But some of those edge cases that you have, so sexual morality amongst adults or things like that, those are not nearly as consequential for the survival of the group. So you're going to see heterogeneity on some of those issues historically and geographically, and that's to be expected as well, because different people are going to find different answers. And what's going to be stable in a given society is what really matters is more that there's agreement within that society than what that agreement is around. Yeah. Uh, you'd mentioned murder, and I, uh, I think that's one of the cases where uh, the language itself is shaped by uh, ethical preconceptions, that um, uh, it, murder is not synonymous with killing, a point you were yeah. making, uh, but it really means uh, a seemingly uh, wrongful killing. Yeah. And so if you say, well, murder is, is bad, that's really just tautological, <laughs> because they, that, that's the meaning of the word. Um, so let's go on now to uh, epistemology. Okay. You would want to cover that and how, how things are known. Uh, how would uh, an atheist, uh, reaching the atheist conclusion, affect uh, how we know things? Well, one of the biggest things is you start realizing that we don't know things nearly as well as we thought we did. <laughs> and this is particularly true and discomforting to a lot of atheists when you start digging into the actual history of science. And you realize that science is, is a tremendous human achievement. And the fact that we've been able to, decade on decade and year on year and century on century, accumulate knowledge and refine knowledge and, and discover things that never, we never would have thought possible. Some of the cosmo, cosmological problems and some of the quantum physics problems and yet, we look at the history of science, and it's this very rough history of people for whom uh, it often takes a while for ideas to gain hold and gain acceptance. Uh, Galileo is actually a really fascinating example of this because he gets a bad, or the whole situation gets kind of a, an incorrect rap because Galileo's empirical data was worse than what he was trying to replace. And what he was doing was he was presenting new empirical data, but he was also introducing a new means of interpreting data. This is with respect to celestial mechanics? This was res with respect to celestial mechanics. So he was saying, I have new data, and this data is 
empirically inferior to what we already have. But I also have a new standard for measuring this data. And this mm -hmm. new standard, oh, what do you know? By this new standard, my data comes out better than yours. Well, he had a lot of, of, he had a lot of difficulty selling anybody on a new standard for measuring old data that mm -hmm. people had been using for generations. And that's often the, the key is when you start changing how people even think about phenomena. Um, our understanding of what matter is. It used to be you had those diagrams of what an atom is and it was unproblematically the neutron and the proton and the electrons. And you start realizing that almost none of that is true empirically in the way that we thought it would be. So Terry Pratchett has an interesting concept that he calls lies to children. And he says this is not a problem. This is just something that we work with where knowledge comes at different resolutions. And sometimes it's not appropriate to, to start at the deepest resolution. It's perfectly acceptable to talk about protons and neutrons and electrons as the fundamental aspects of reality if you're teaching you know, elementary school children. Um, but then if, they be, if they're in college and they're studying physics, you better not be covering it at that resolution. You better be getting into quarks and you better be getting into muons and all of that level. And the deeper, the cl tighter the resolution is, the more that you actually see that where the real problems in the given disciplines are. So evolution, when you're talking with a creationist, it's very trivial to just say, well, evolution is provably superior to creationism. But it gets much more complicated when you actually start talking with the people who are actively engaged with scientific research in that discipline. Because right now we don't know, for example, why it is that some species will produce members who cannot reproduce, you know, ants, for mm -hmm. instance. And th there's this whole concept of eusocial evolution that there's several different perspectives that are all pro being professed by different, uh, you know, qualified scientists and, and we don't know. And it's even worse in some of the, uh, you know, cosmology and questions of... That become pure mathematics. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Jordan. Uh, the evening has really flown by uh, uh, very quickly. I'm sure we've gone this much longer. Uh, for those of you in our audience, <clears throat> I hope that you've enjoyed tonight's program and you've seen throughout the evening uh, contact information for Minnesota Atheists, our web address as well as a phone number and postal address. And if you contact us and send us your postal address, we will send you one free issue of our monthly newsletter. Uh, if you send us your email address, we'll put you on distribution for Atheist Weekly Email, our weekly calendar of events. So if you're interested in us, we're interested in you. <laughs>